Hi, I'm Grant from Blackmagic Design, and in this update, I'd like to talk about DaVinci Resolve and collaborative workflows. I think we've developed a really great cloud workflow, and it's really exciting. But before I start, I wanted to talk, to quick, you know, talk quickly about Hyperdeck. Um, so we're going to be announcing a new model today. It's called Hyperdeck Shuttle HD. So let me show you, and we'll check it out. As you can see, it's very different. Um, the biggest difference is really the front panel. It's uh, designed for desktop use. It's the same profile, actually, as A2 Mini Extreme. But it's a full hyperdeck. Um, now the, dom the design is really dominated by this large search tile on the front there. Yeah, your hand really na naturally rests on it, so it's really nice to use. So I'll show you if I turn it sideways, you can see it, it really nests, rests there really nicely. And then you have these really big transport control buttons at the top there, the same as traditional broadcast decks. Uh, I'll show you the rear connections. So around the back there, you can see there's uh, the connections. So there's HDMI in and out, uh, and you can record and play via HDMI. Now it's actually a HD model, so it handles NTSC, PAL, 720p, 1080i, and 1080p formats. Now the HDMI makes it perfect for A2 Mini because it plugs straight in. Now there's a USB-C connection on the back for recording and playing to external discs. Uh, plus it has an SD card slot at the top there, and it handles both SD cards and UHS-2 cards. There's also a 1G Ethernet port, so that means any ATEM switcher can control the deck using Ethernet, even A2 Minis. So you can trigger playback like in macros. Uh, plus there's a standard 12 volt DC power connection, and it includes a power supply. So let's plug it in. There we are there. So I have a HDMI monitor here uh, so we can see the playback. So what I'll do is I'll plug in the power first. And I'll plug in the HDMI. There it is. Now I'll insert an SD card. There it is there. Um, so after it's checked the card out to play, I just press play. See, there it is. Uh, so you can see it's playing back the clips uh, on the monitor. Uh, to loop playback, you just press play a uh, second time and it'll loop all clips. Uh, it'll loop one clip if you, if you have the clip button down. Um, so let's try out the search dial. Um, so to do that, you press the jog and scroll buttons to use it. So I can use, there's a jog button there and I can do jog. You can see that I'm jogging around. It also has a uh, scroll, which is uh, there. So it's like a faster jog, so you can see it's nice. Now to shuttle, it also has shuttle. So to shuttle, you push both the jog and scroll buttons at the same time, like that. Now you can see I can shuttle up and down the media. So it's like, you know, a traditional broadcast deck shuttle, now I'm going backwards. Uh, now you might have noticed the clip button, I mentioned it a second ago. It's used to stop playback after the current clip. Oops. Um, now that's really important when you're playing clips into a switcher. Like you could have a card with a lot of TV commercials or music videos and stuff like that. And you don't really want it playing into the next clip accidentally. So we put a clip button on it and um, that'll stop the playback at the end of that clip. Now you can see there's also a record button. Uh, so you just push that when you want to record. You know, this Hyperdeck is a fantastic master recorder for A2 Mini as well. Now you might have noticed that there's actually no LCD on it. So like, how do you change the menus? So that's easy because the menus are actually overlaid on the video output. It's why the menu buttons are recessed. You can see them there. Because uh, you don't want to accidentally push one of those buttons when you're in the middle of, you know, playing back. So let me show you how the menus work by pressing the menu button here. And if you look at the screen, you can see it come up. Now you use the search dial to go through the menus, like that. And then when you, you want to go into a menu, press set. So I'll press set. And there it is there. So it supports ProRes, DNX, and H.264 file formats. Uh, so you have all the codecs you need for live production or post-production. It really has codecs for both. Now it supports long recordings into a single file, plus you get true interlaced H.264 format. Now that's really important with 1080i HD formats, but it's also important for recording NTSC and PAL formats. You know, all the archive content you might be recording is generally NTSC, PAL, or 1080i HD formats, and it's interlaced. So with an interlaced H.264 files, it's a really an important feature for archive. You know, it keeps the original image structure of the videotape unchanged because you're capturing everything. Now there is another cool feature we put in there, um, and it's a teleprompter. Uh, it's got a teleprompter built in. You know, with a big large search style, we thought it'd be fun to add a teleprompter. Now, it just is easy, it just uses RTF text files as a script. So let me show you how to enable it. Uh, the settings are in the video format menu. So all I need to do is go down to the codex, and I'll go in there, and uh, I can scroll down the bottom. And it's all the way down the bottom there. I'll just push set. Now it'll switch over, and I better close that menu. Now what I need to do though is I need to insert an SD card with an RTF script file, so I'll do that. Now I have a, a card here with scripts on it, this one. So let's have a look at it in the computer and I'm going to show you what they look like. So I've got the computer here and I've just inserted the file. 
So you can see I've got a couple of scripts here. So I can open them up and you can see I've got a just a standard RTF file in this is in text edit. Uh, so now let's load the script back into the Hyperdeck Shuttle HD. So we'll uneject that. Take the script file out. I'll insert it into the Hyperdeck. Now the Hyperdeck will show the text file on screen. It's reading the RTF file, text file just like a video codec. And I can even play it. So I'll play it. See, there it is. Um, so it's playing the text file just like it's a video file. It also picks up formatting from the RTF file. It, it uses a built-in font, but most of the other formatting is actually read from the file. So like font color or font weight um, is read from the file. Now you also might notice that the font size, it's bigger than what the document was, which was 12 point. That's because teleprompters need a larger font size for display. So we have a setting for font scaling. So you can write a script in a normal font size and the Hyperdeck will actually scale it up for display for you. So you don't need to keep like changing the font size in the, in the text file between display and between editing. Um, there's also settings for margin plus vertical and horizontal flip. It's pretty important you can do that because the prompt is obviously mounted on the front of a camera and you've got all the you know, mechanical limitations of how it's mounted so you might want to need to flip it or set the margins. But I think it's pretty exciting having a prompter built into Hyperdeck. You know, you can follow the presenter with the search style. Um, it works with jog, scroll and shuttle. So let me show you that actually. If you go to jog, you can see I can scroll through. You can see it's picked up the colors. Uh, it's actually really nice and smooth, you know. And you can use scroll if you need to move through the script faster. See, it's like really fast. Or you can use shuttle, and that's more like our traditional prompter would work. See, there it is there. So you can set the speed of scrolling, even go backwards. There's an indicator at the top right-hand side of the screen to show you what it's doing. Um, so it's so nice. Now the next clip and previous clip buttons will let you switch between clips, uh, between scripts, sorry. So if I go between them, you can see I can change the scripts. That's a different script. There it is there. So it's pretty cool, you know? I've got to scroll, there's job. So you can have more than one script on the card and then you can just switch between them. So the new Hyperdeck Shuttle HD will retail for $4.95. You know, it's really such a unique design and it's very powerful. Plus Hyperdeck Shuttle HD is available now. And it's so many uses, it's a master recorder, it's a media player for live production switches, and it's also a teleprompter. So it's really exciting. Anyway, so now let's talk about cloud workflows. Now we've been working on this for a long time. Uh, however, I think it might be a good idea to explain our thinking on cloud workflows. There's really two issues we have to consider. One's technical, but the other one's actually black magic culture. And culture is quite important. It's not, this is not just a technical problem. So how do we create a cloud workflow that still fits with our original culture? So we thought it'd be good to mention some of the culture rules we use that guide us. Uh, and the first is really probably related to subscription software licenses. You know, if you have a TV subscription, you only really lose access to movies if you can't pay for it. However, in our industry, you're actually creating content, not consuming it, not just consuming it, you know? So the work you create is in the software you use, and that could be years of work. So the problem with software subscriptions is if, you know, you lose your work if you can't pay, and you have to pay up every month even if you can't afford it. So what happens if you're out of work for a few months? Um, there's really nothing you can do, you still have to pay. And if you don't pay, you lose your ability to work, you know. But on some software, you could even lose years of work. So you kind of get punished the more you use the software. So why do vendors use subscription licenses? Um, this is new, and it wasn't really like this in the past. And I think really to understand this change, you have to understand how tech companies are funded now. All venture capitalists really seem to care about now is subscriber accounts. So if you want to invest a, you know, if you want to invest a money for a tech startup, then you have to comply with their business model. And what this really means is that they're really focused on a thing called customer lifetime value. And what they're investing in is companies that can lock in a customer. So a company's value is really calculated by estimating the profit expected from the customers over time. That's why so many technology companies have sky high valuations. Even if the tech company doesn't make a profit, it's because the investors believe they're locking in customers for life. But the problem is customers hate it. You, know, you simply won't have a customer for life if the customers don't like how you treat them. Um, but you know, investors in technology companies don't really seem to notice that. You know, I've noticed a lot of people seem to be investing in stuff they've got, you know, technology got very little understanding of. So I think with DaVinci, we have a better business model here. It's actually free. So it's easy to download and it's easy to learn how to use. And then over time, if you do well and start to make some money, perhaps you buy something from us. You know, you might upgrade to a color panel or an audio console. You know, for us to make money, we actually have to help you make money. We only do well, do well if you do well. And, you know, plus our engineers are really, you know, motivated to stay focused on what you need. So this means we can't design a cloud workflow that locks up your work. You know, it would be against our culture. So, and there is another cultural rule that's also very important to us. It's about tracking users and selling your data. As a secondary business, business a lot of technology is now used to track customers. So the software you use actually creates profiles of your behavior. And that information can be sold. You know, so much of the tech industry nowadays is all about big data. 
and it's tracking your every move. You know, it, tracking every move you do has become extremely valuable. So Blackmagic Designer will never do this. This means we can't design a cloud workflow that tracks and collects information on you. What you do should be private. This is extremely important to us. So just because so many tech companies do it doesn't make it right. So when designing a cloud workflow, we have to work with these cultural constraints because they're really important to us. It's you know, a culture thing. So now let's talk about the technical issues. Um, now there are a few ways we could have done this, but we think the best you know, solution here is to use a technology that's already been proven to work, and that's email. Email uses a central data server, but you use a local app. It could be an app running on your phone. It could be like a mail app running on a computer. Now you can use web email, of course, but nobody really does that because it's slow and cumbersome and really clunky. That's why most people actually use the internet via various apps these days. You get a local app that has a user interface and it instantly responds to you. But in the case of email, your devices collaborate using a you know, data on a central server. That means your phone, your tablet, your laptop, your desktop computer, they all stay in sync. Um, and now we've done the same thing. We've used the same method for DaVinci Resolve and it works incredibly well. Um, plus nothing really beats downloading software for free and running on the computer you already own. That's why we went with the technology solution used with email. Email solved this problem decades ago and it works really well. But in our case, we're not really syncing between devices, we're syncing between people. People with different talents and experiences, you know, editors, colorists, visual effects artists, audio engineers, all working together, all on the same project, all at the same time. Even multiple people working on the same timeline. So it's really cool. And that's how we've designed the DaVinci Resolve cloud workflow. You download and use DaVinci Resolve on your computer. The project data can be stored on a centralized server. Everyone can share and work on it from any location in the planet. And it's a true global workflow. Uh, one main thing that makes this work so well is the new Apple M1 chips. They're so fast. Um, you know, we've been completely rewriting the, you know, the processing pipeline of DaVinci Resolve to take advantage of it. You might have noticed we've had a bunch of DaVinci Resolve releases over the last year as we've completed this work. Each update has dramatically increased the speed of DaVinci Resolve. So now anyone can do heavy, heavy image processing just using off-the-shelf computers. Uh, now there's really two parts to this workflow. We'll be introducing a new Blackmagic Cloud web service and we'll also be introducing DaVinci Resolve 18. Now DaVinci Resolve 18 supports the Blackmagic Cloud. So let me show you how it works. Um, now the first step is to go to the Blackmagic Cloud website. It's really easy and you just click the Blackmagic Cloud icon on our web page. So this is the Blackmagic Cloud homepage. It's where you log in or you create your Blackmagic, like a new Blackmagic ID. Now I already have a Blackmagic Cloud ID, so let's log in. Put my password. So you can see I have some services here, but the project server is the one where we want to create the DaVinci Resolve project library. The DaVinci Resolve library is where you put your DaVinci projects. So let's select a new library. First, you need to name the library. So we'll call ours Winter Wonderland. And you also need to select a server. Normally you select a server located close to where you are. And let it set itself up. So we'll let it set itself up. Now it's basically initializing the library on the servers. And there it is. So now we have a cloud library set up and ready to use. So let's go back to DaVinci Resolve 18 and then use this new library. DaVinci Resolve 18 is, um, supports Blackmagic Cloud and I have it here. There it is. Now it's really very uh, simple to set up. All I need to do is click on the Cloud tab. So I'll go to the Project window. You can see here. Um, this is where my um, Cloud projects are stored. Um, now I need to log into Blackmagic Cloud to see my project. So let's do that. I just enter my Blackmagic Cloud ID and also my password. Oops. Let it sign in. Now you can see the library I created. There it is. Now we don't have any projects loaded into the library, so let's do that now. Now I actually have a local project that I want to share with a colorist. Um, so I'll select the local panel and let's export this project. Here it is here. Now, um, well I'll, I'll export it. There it is there. Um, Put it on the desktop. There it is. Now um, we have a DaVinci Resolve project file on the desktop. Now most people call these DRP files, but it's the whole project exported into a file. So let's import that project into Blackmagic Cloud. 
Let's go back to the Cloud tab and I go Import. And you can do this in reverse. There it is there. So you can take items out of the Cloud Library and put them in back into the local project. And there it is there. So let's open it. So we can click on the timeline. Oh, it's already up. And there it is. Now it opens like normal. Um, you can see there it is there, that's our project. Um, it's very hard to even know it's a cloud project. It just looks the same as a local project. You know, we can change edits and do various things. It's you know super easy. What I really need to do is get some help with the color correction. So I want to share this project with a colorist. You know, imagine using a freelance colorist on this job. So let's do that. So let's call a colorist and I can show how all this works. But first we have to share the project with the colorist. Um, we can do it in Blackmagic Cloud or we can actually do it in the Cloud tab in DaVinci Resolve. Now we use their Blackmagic Cloud ID to share our project with them. So let's do that now. So I'll get their ID. And I go to the project. And I'll share. There it is. Another thing we need to do is set the project to multi-user collaboration. Um, we can have the bin set to single user, but only one person can work on it at a time. Or you can have multiple people working on this uh, project at the same time. So like someone could edit while someone else is doing color, you know, color grading the clips. You could have dozens of people all working on the project simultaneously. So we need to set multi-user collaboration and that's in the file menu. So it's up here, and go down to there. There it is. Now I can work on the project while the colorist is grading. I'll reopen it. Plus DaVinci uh, Resolve now when multi-user collaboration will constantly save the changes as they work. So let's call the colorist. We've got them on Skype here. Hey, the camera and this monitor moves around. Hey, how you doing? Hello, freelance hey, colorist. How are you? Good, Hi. how are you? <laughs> Thanks. So uh, I want you to color grade my edit. Um, so I've shared it with you. Um, so can you share your screen and sure. we can see you log into DaVinci Resolve? So that'd be really great. Yeah, no problem. Let's share it here. There you go, I can see you. I'll bring mine up full screen. So you should be able to refresh and there it is. There it is. So cool, I went to Wonderland. I can hear you really clearly. It sounds like you're only a few blocks away. <laughs> <laughs> a good internet connection. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so I'll just need to relink that. Yep. There, there we are. go, and this is the cool. timeline here that needs grading? Yep. Yeah, there it is. I can see the timeline. That's my timeline. Great. Um, great. Looks like it's all there. And it looks yeah, like my yeah. edit. So cool, if you can go to the color page and start grading. Start with this first shot here. Bring up my scopes. Oh, and yeah. Go. Cool. I should be able to see these grades here in my edit, so I'll switch back to my DaVinci Resolve so I can watch from my DaVinci. Yeah, no problem. Do you want me to just, I, I can just work through all the shots and get that yeah. all graded for you? That's great, you know. So when anyone changes anything, you can see it here in the viewer. Now it won't update automatically, um, as that'd be confusing, but there will be an icon come up in the viewer that allows you to accept these changes. So you can see it there. There it is. Now you can see the grades and the timeline. That grade's been done remotely. See these, this is, looks so good. So that's the timeline where the color correction's added. We can actually see that. I'll accept those grades. We can see that because I can enable and disable the grades. Grades are great. You can see that even the, um, you can see what the clip the clip the colorist is working on if I change to the color page. There you go. So this is great when you have two colorists working on 
uh, the same project. So in the color page, you can see uh, there's the icon there. So this, this workflow is really quite flexible. You know, it can be used in a bunch of different ways so you can develop your own workflows. Um, so it looks cool. There you are, working remotely. So thanks for that. I think your grades look really nice and I'll let you keep color grading and uh, we'll talk to you later. No problems. Thanks, Grant. No worries. Take care. See, See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Cool. This is great. Oh, look at that. You can see Elizabeth moving down the grade. She must be checking the grades. You can actually see the grade she's working on as she's moving through the clips. This is so awesome when you've got more than one person working together. It's really cool. Imagine on-set grading where the color is actually in a post facility with a color accurate monitor and a big color panel. It would completely transform an on-set grading because they could work remotely, but at the same time the shoot's actually happening. Now the reason this works so well is we had we both had a copy of the media. Now we use Dropbox to sync the media between the computers. I can show you the media on my Dropbox. I have it down here in the web browser. There it is there. So that was my media. Now we installed the Dropbox software on this computer so it's synced. Um, but this means we both had copies of the media. However, Dropbox normally only downloads the files when you need them. And that actually doesn't work very well for video editing because it would slow everything down while you waited for files to come down. So to fix, their, fix this, there is actually a setting in Dropbox that lets you cache everything locally. And I can show you that so you kind of know what, how to make that work. Um, so this is a setting here. That's the one you want to set. This will make sure that the media is fully downloaded to the computer so the inventory resolve can see it. And you can even actually do it by folder. So if I go into, let me minimize some of these things. I can actually go into the Dropbox media and I can right click. And this is the setting down here that lets you cache it all down. You can do it by folder. So it works quite well. So this is how you give everyone a local copy of the media. And it works quite well, but there is actually a limitation. What if there's not enough space on your local computer? And it's worse for freelancers who are working on multiple projects at the same time. All the media has to be synced before you can open the timeline. So everything has to be downloaded for each user. So the problem is, of course, is if you had like five people in a building working on a job, you've actually got to download the data five times. So what we really need is a network storage solution designed for film and television. Now we've done that and it's called Blackmagic Cloud Store. It's a very high performance network storage with Dropbox Sync. But because it's network storage, everybody can share the files on it. But it's also a Dropbox cache that's constantly syncing your media. Plus it includes a bunch of features designed to solve cloud workflows in film and television. So let me show it to you, I'll bring it out. Um, let me move the hypothetical side. Here it is. So as you can see, it actually uses the same design as our Blackmagic eGPU, but it's obviously very different internally. You know, we wanted to design a style that sort of suits a modern post-production facility. Um, so it had to be attractive. Plus it's important that it's portable so you can take it to a shoot. But it also to me needs to be really quiet because you know, if you're doing audio work, you don't want to hear sound from the fan. Uh, but it's important it needs massive performance so you can use it with these really big digital film files. It also needs to support sync so you can distribute media globally to each user. So it actually needs to do a lot of things. It's you know, much more than a network storage solution. It features advanced technology. You know, it runs Blackmagic OS, so it's quite intelligent. It uses high-speed M.2 uh, flash memory cards, so it's very fast. Plus, the flash, mem the flash memory cards are configured in a RAID 5, so there's redundancy. You know, M.2 flash memory cards are incredibly reliable, but they've, you know, this is an added level of protection. So I'll, let's check out the rear connections. I'll spin it around and show you. There it is there, you can see. So you can see the connectors. Now there's four high-speed 10G Ethernet connections built in. So it actually has a built-in 10G Ethernet switch so you can plug in four separate computers. So it's great for you know, like creating small work groups really quickly. And that really matters when you're on location. Plus there's an extra two 1G Ethernet ports for connecting the slower networks. It has two USB-C ports. One's for loading files directly and the other one's for backups. So you could like you know, connect a large mechanical hard disk as a, to back up the Blackmagic Cloud Store. Now there's also a HDMI monitoring output connection, so you can use it for monitoring the status of Blackmagic Cloud Store. There's also at the top a read-only button that lets you lock out any file changes if required. Now for redundancy, it actually has two separate internal power supplies. So it'll keep running if one of the power supplies fails. So let's connect it up so I can show you how it works. So I'll turn it around. So we'll plug in the power. Now uh, let's connect it to the Mac Studio here uh, with its Ethernet. 
Now, newer high performance computers often have uh, 10G Ethernet. This Mac Studio has 10G Ethernet. But if the computer you, uh, you're using has 1G Ethernet, or it's a laptop with no Ethernet, then you can use a Thunderbolt to 10G Ethernet adapter. You know, we have one here. And that'll give you 10G Ethernet. So let's mount the Blackmagic Cloud Store on this computer. So just go to the network tab. There it is there. And there's the folder. And there it is. And that's all there is to it. Now we can access the disk. Now the first version of Blackmagic Cloud Store uses uh, guest logins, the software that's in it. Um, that keeps it really simple, but we're gonna add some custom logins soon and, you know, and some software updates so the IT people will be happy. But most people actually have secure local networks, so it's okay for the moment. Uh, doing this makes it really easy to set it up without any technical knowledge. So before we copy some files, I thought it might be a good idea to click the HDMI monitoring so you can really help you see what's going on when we copy the files. So I'll plug in this HDMI monitor here and you'll be able to see it. There we go. Now you can see there's actually a lot on this monitor. So uh, let me explain what's on there. So the top left is the name. It can be customized with the Cloud Store Utility software. Below that is the capacity indicator. It shows you how much space has been used. Now below that area is actually the sinks currently operating. Then you have the connected users. You can see my computer's actually connected there. At the bottom of that is the hardware information. It's got the status of the two power supplies and things like that. And now on the right hand side is the storage map. Now this really dominates the display and it shows you which areas of the store have information on them. The purple cells actually is where there's data held on the store. Then the cells turn like a light blue when there's data being read. And then the cells turn orange when there's data being written. The size of the cell is actually on the lower left hand side and it changes based on the total storage capacity. Now below the storage map is the data rate graphs. Now these show the data rates for each of the four 10G Ethernet ports. It also actually shows the connection speed. The connection speed is actually shown on the vertical axis of the graph. So if the label goes to 10, then you know that the 10G Ethernet it's running at the full 10G speed. So it's actually really a lot of information displayed on this monitoring. Anyway, so now let's copy some media, the media folder across to the cloud store, and we can actually watch it on the display as it's copying. So I'll do that. Here's my Winter Wonderland folder here. So I'll copy it over. So you can see the data rate graph is now showing the data being written. Now the writes are in orange, you can actually see that on the, uh, the orange cell light up on the storage map. It's showing that the file is being written to the store. Plus, you know, there's a couple of big files on the disk already taking up a lot of space. So we can actually delete those files and, and watch the storage uh, map change. So that file's, that, that uh, folder's finished being copied. Now let's delete, and if you watch the storage map, if we cut to that, you'll actually see these files when I delete them, you'll see them all disappear. Oh, that was quick. So sometimes, depending if you've got a lot of files, you can see it actually, you know, you can actually see them as they're deleted. So it's pretty cool. Now we've updated the relink feature in DaVinci Resolve 18, so you can now always relink to a different media folder. It allows you to switch between media folders, which is really important when you want to change between network storage and local storage. So my project was pointing to the local storage on this computer, but now I want to change it to the folder I copied across to the cloud source. So I'll just relink. So let me show you that. So I've still got DaVinci running. And I'll go back to my edit. Oh, my cut page. Oh, I'll actually accept all those color grades that were changed. Because Luzner kept grading. Okay, so this is the local media. So now I relink. And I'll go to the Cloud Store. There it is there. There's the Winter Wonderland folder I just copied. And it'll relink, and there it is. So now the project will use the folder on the Cloud Store. And if you actually watch the monitor, you can see it reading from the Cloud Store. So let me shuttle the timeline up and down a bit and I'll show you. So you can see it there. So you can see the blue line, you can see the, the cell lighting up. That's DaVinci you know, reading the media file on the Cloud Store. And you can also see the data rate graph showing the Ethernet ports transferring data. Um, so all the users opening this project can now relink to the Cloud Store media, so no one really needs to use any space on their local computers. But if you really want to sync the media globally, we can do this by syncing to Dropbox. So when I had the colorist grade my shots, they already had my media, and we did that manually, but the Cloud Store can also do that for you. So it only needs to connect to a Dropbox so it can sync. Once the Cloud Store syncs to Dropbox, it's possible for other Cloud Stores to sync to the same Dropbox as well, and that would create a global media sync. So anyone sharing the project only needs to have their Cloud Store synced. And then everyone has a copy of the media. But, you know, of course, be careful. If you delete a clip, it'll delete everywhere. So make sure you back up your camera originals before you, you do that. Uh, so let's set up a sync on the Cloud Store. It's easy, and we just need to create a sync in the Blackmagic Cloud Utility. So let's do that now. So, but actually, first, before I do that, I should actually make sure that the Cloud Store is connected to the Internet. So let's do that. So I have the Internet on a, on a separate cable. And I'll plug that in. There is now the Cloud Store can talk directly to Dropbox servers on the Internet. Um, next, we need to launch the cloud, uh, Blackmagic Cloud Setup Utility. 
which I'll do that. Now this utility is used for changing settings. There's network settings in here and time and date and things like that. But let's select the sync tab. Now the first step is to log into Dropbox, into your Dropbox account. But to save time, I've already logged into my Dropbox account, so we don't need to do that. But we do need data sync, so let's do that now. There is there. So we need a name for the sync, and we also need to select the Dropbox folder and the Cloud Store folder. Now I've already got a media, um, I've already got the media on my Dropbox account, so I can just select the folder and it should be pretty easy to do. So oops. So we'll go here and there's my Winter Wonderland. Now on the Dropbox account. Ah, oh, there it is. That's the only thing I've got on there. Um, you can, now you can also select which direction you want to do. You can allow a team to read the files but not change anything and that's important if you've got camera originals like these. But in my case, we'll just allow a two-way sync. So any files, any new files we synced automatically. It also means our colors will automatically get those new files when we created them. So now I've created the sync and you can see actually on the monitor that the sync's been created, plus it's actually checking the Dropbox and uploading any files. Now there is one file missing on Dropbox so it's uploading that file now. You know, any files added to this uh, Blackmagic Cloud store will sync to Dropbox and then they'll sync to, down to other cloud stores so everybody has a copy of the media. Now it's constantly, it constantly syncs, you don't really need to do anything. Um, and we're going to obviously expand to other sync services soon like you know, we've got Google Drive support almost complete. That'll update will ship in a few weeks. We didn't quite make a uh, ship date on these things but you know, we're getting really close. So it's all exciting but there is actually an issue with sync. If you don't have an extremely fast internet connection then the, the sync can be slow. You know, I did, recently I did a multicam video with seven cameras and it had a terabyte of media. So the data can build up really quickly and it could take a long time to upload. So yeah, what can we do? Well, the solution is to actually use proxies. However, to make it work, we really had to redesign how DaVinci handled proxies. That's because the storage and DaVinci both need to know how to use them. And if we don't have a consistent way to handle proxies then everything just gets confusing. So in DaVinci Resolve 18, there's a whole new way, uh, there's a whole new proxy workflow built in. We can automatically render proxies with a new proxy generator app. Proxies are now stored in a folder within the media. Uh, but you can actually extract them to a separate folder for offline work. But proxies will now act as a HD substitute for the original media files. They're really easy to locate because they're always stored in a folder called proxies. And because proxies are now predictable, they become much more powerful. Now we've now, we've, so we've created a new tool called Blackmagic Proxy Generator. It's included free with DaVinci Resolve Studio and it's installed in the Applications folder. So let me show it to you. I'll save that. There it is there. You can see it's very simple. It just watches folders and creates proxies automatically. So let's add a watch folder. And I'll do both the media folder and the whole disk. So there's a media folder. And I'll add the whole disk. Um, this means it'll process the Winter Wonderland first as it's first in the list and it'll process the you know, it processes the folders in list order. And you can actually click and rearrange a list. Let me show you that. Let me create a bit more name for the volume. So you can re you know, rechange the order. You can also select the proxy format. So you can select half resolution H64, or you can actually select some full resolution HD formats in H64, H65, and ProRes formats. Let's select full HD resolution H64 proxies and then start the app, which is that one there, which is already selected. Uh, but be careful if you change proxy formats, of course. If you change to a different format, it'll recreate all the proxies in that format. So you can see now it's checking the disk and then it's starting to render the proxies. So what's exciting is you can speed up the proxy rendering by running multiple copies of the proxy generator at the same time. So each computer could have a copy and then you could just run them all at the same time. So it basically creates an instant render farm for proxies. And once the proxies are finished rendering, it just keeps watching for any new media files. If any new media files appear, it'll automatically generate the proxies for them. And then this cloud store will uh, sync them automatically. And in fact, if you can look, uh, yeah, there it is there. If you look, you can see it's starting to sync the, um, the proxies as they're being generated. So they've started syncing now. And the, pro and the cloud store will sync proxies before any other file type. So this means you could move like a big job anywhere in the world in 15 minutes or so. That's because the proxies are only a few gigabytes, so they, they copy very quickly. Even on standard internet connections. Um, now you can actually also set the cloud store to transfer proxies only, which means freelancers don't need to use original media files, they can just work with the proxies. Now the proxies I've generated here are starting to sync automatically to Dropbox, which means they're now syncing down to other cloud stores. So let's check out how we can use them in DaVinci Resolve 18. 
Now, because proxies are created in a predictable way, they're much more useful. It allows DaVinci Resolve 18 to handle the proxies automatically because the proxies are built right into the workflow now. And there's a new proxy menu that shows, you know, that's where you can select the proxies. So let me show you that. There it is there, there's the proxy menu. So you can select the preferred proxy. So DaVinci will use the proxies if they've been rendered by the proxy generator. So I'll show you, so you can prefer proxies. Or if you select the preferred camera originals, then it'll use the camera originals. Uh, just does it automatically, it's so simple to use. Plus you get a purple line in the timeline if there's a proxy file but no camera original. And that's important as sometimes you might be editing with proxies but you don't have the originals. So it makes it really easy to find the shots so you don't have any originals. You know, when you work as a group, multiple people could be adding media to projects. So this helps you find any originals that might be missing. Now, there's also a setting to turn the proxies off. And if you turn the proxies off and don't have an original, then the clip will be shown offline because the proxy's off, so it's not available. Plus in DaVinci Resolve 18, we can use the timeline indicator to show offline clips as well, so that helps. Offline clips will be shown with a red line. But what really matters here is that proxy files are a substitute for the original media file, and then DaVinci manages them all automatically. So it's nice, but what happens if we want to do an offline workflow? For example, you want to travel and you want to take the proxies with you on a laptop. Your proxies are much smaller, so you can fit them on you know, a lot of jobs on your computer. But if the proxies are stored in all the folders and with the original files, how do we get them out? Well, that's easy. The proxy generator has an extract proxies function. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you that to you. So I'll go back to the proxy generator. Um, now, first, I actually, before I do that, I have to rename my proxy folder that I originally had, my original proxy folder on the desktop. If I don't do that, it'll just merge the proxies into that folder which can be useful, but you don't actually want to do that because you know in this demonstration here, because I want to take my proxies away in a separate folder um, so I can take them and work offline. So let me rename that first. Okay, there we go. Now, first we have to stop the app, which we've done there. So now it's stopped, and now we can select the Winter One Land folder and extract the proxies. There it is there. And you can see there's the extract proxies there. So we'll do it on the desktop. There it's done. You can see them there on the desktop. So let's compare the proxies to the originals. So I can do this just by getting info. So you can see there the originals are 18 gigabytes, but the proxies are only around 350 megabytes, so it's so tiny. You can fit a lot of jobs in your laptop by using proxies. And it'll also extract like audio, images, and other stuff that's in the media folder. The only thing missing will actually be the camera original files. Uh, the whole folder structure is intact, and the proxies are still in the proxy folders. And DaVinci Resolve will just treat them the same as the original, so it just works. Each camera original has a proxy file that works as a stand-in for the original. So now I can just take this computer away and re work remotely. So overall, I think this is a much better way to handle proxies now. But the big advantage is that proxies are now predictable, so other products can use them. That's why they work so well in DaVinci Resolve. You know, there's rules now on how proxies work. Um, it's also the key to how the cloud store can recognize proxies and sync them first. Or you can select the cloud store to sync only proxies, which is good. So often you don't need the originals, like if you're doing work such as color correction, you can just use the proxies. You know, in the, in the past people spent a lot of time managing proxies, you know. Now you don't have to do any of that, you don't have to worry about anything because you just push a button in the proxy generator and it'll make sure they're all okay. However, that's not all we can do with proxies. Remember the Hyperdeck shuttle that we talked about before? Well, we are working on a new software update for it. It'll let you play back from the cloud store. Now what's really exciting about this is that the proxy files do, you know, let you do this. It's because it's a HD deck, it'll play back HD files. But with a proxy generator, it'll convert all the media to HD proxies. Even high resolution, you know, 12K digital film files, everything just gets converted to HD proxies. And plus all the proxies are in proxy folders, so it's consistent and it's predictable. So this means the Hyperdeck Shuttle HD can find and play the, uh, the proxies. It totally transforms the Hyperdeck Shuttle into a media browser. The trick is the proxy generator. You know, it does all the hard work. Now the proxy generator will render to H64 main profile files or ProRes 422 files, and both those formats can be played back with the Hyperdeck Shuttle HD. So to make this work, we've been developing some new software for Hyperdeck Shuttle. It allows playback from network storage. And we've also added the source tape feature for Nutri Results cut page. So this means we can actually play through the whole disk and navigate up, navigate up and down folders. So let me show you how this works. I've got a Hyperdeck Shuttle HD running this new software here. There it is here. So it looks the same, obviously. So let's plug it in. Um, what I'll do is I'll get rid of this guy. I'll move this out of the way. I'll plug in the power. So I'll move our cloud store over a little. In fact, I'll give us a little bit more space. There it is there. And we'll plug in the HDMI from the monitoring into the cloud store. So 
sorry, into the Hyperdeck shuttle, from the cloud store into the Hyperdeck shuttle. Um, so now let's plug the Hyperdeck shuttle into the Ethernet so I can access this cloud store. So I've got a Ethernet cable here. These Ethernet cables are so stiff. Um, now what we need to do is go into the menus because we need to select the network storage. So we just go into the menu. There it is there. And we can scroll along. There it is there. We can go down there. You can see the Blackmagic Cloud Store, so let's select it. So now we can play back direct from the Cloud Store. There it is. Now it's actually playing back the proxies, not the camera original media. Uh, with such a big disk, how do you navigate? You know, and we also have a solution to that. Uh, when you're in scroll, it'll display a file path. It's a path to the file you're viewing, so let's try it out. So if I push so, uh, scroll, you can see it there. You can see the file path. Now when I scroll, you can see the files and they're including, uh, the files where they're enclosing folders. So you can see me there. I'll scroll down a bit so you can see the folder change. There it is there, rides and people and things like that. One thing that's important actually is um, I've set the default television standard in the menu. In my case, I shoot everything at 24 frames a second, so I just select the default video standard at 1080p 24. Then when you select shuttle, it just flattens everything in that type, you know, in that frame rate, it'll flatten everything on the cloud store alphabetically, you know, like folders alphabetically. Uh, all the content in the cloud store has been turned into just one big continuous timeline, but you can also navigate down into folders. Um, so I can scroll along and look at the media I'm interested in, and then if I press scroll again, it'll go down one folder level. So let's do that. So let's have a look for a folder here, rides. So if I push scroll again, you can see the folder highlight white, and I'll do it again because I actually want to select the, the rides folder. Now the scroll will be limited to that folder only, but if you want to navigate back up, you press clip. But let me just scroll around and show you. So now it's limited to the rides folder only. That's all the way one way and all the way the other. And if I press clip, I go back up to the higher level. See, there I am. So now I'm back into the whole lot. See, I'm back to everything. So you can see it's really nice and it's very easy to use. So this new Hyperdeck shuttle software will be available free of charge, and I think it'd probably ship in a month or two. You know, we wanted to really focus on shipping the Hyperdeck shuttle first, and then we'll continue to work on this software update. Plus, with the new file browsing, it'll also work with the media cards and USB disks, which I think will be really nice. So it's quite a big update, and I think it'll be very exciting. Okay, so now let's talk about what happens if you build a large facility. Now, I really wanted to show you how fast the Blackmagic Cloud Store is, and it's pretty important because this is designed for high-end film and television work. So it has to handle these workflows. So, you know, let's add a lot of uses to this cloud store. Um, actually, first, let me connect the HDMI back so you can see what's what's going on. And yeah, there it is. And now we can get the monitoring back up. Okay, so to demonstrate performance, what we've done is we've set up the Blackmagic Design training booth in the studio. And we can use it to simulate adding a lot of users to the cloud store. So let's pan the cameras over and you can check it out. There's everyone's over here. Hi, everyone. So. You can see that's the whole training booth that we normally use at trade shows. Um, now all these computers are actually connected to an Ethernet switch, so now I need to plug that um, switch into the cloud store. So let's do that now. Here's the cable. I'll unplug that. Okay, so now they're all connected to this Blackmagic cloud store, and each computer has a Thunderbolt to 10G Ethernet adapter. Um, so there's 12 computers in total, and now we'll get everyone to connect to the cloud store. So can everyone connect to the cloud store? We should be able to watch it on the monitoring output. You can see everyone connecting. Yeah, look at that. Um, so the next step is I need to share my project with everyone so they can actually work on it. And that's easy. You know, we did it before with the freelance cars. We just uh, add their Blackmagic Cloud IDs. Uh, and I'll show you how to do that. But I do have a lot of people here. So what I do is I'll paste in a list of Blackmagic Cloud IDs all at once. Uh, I have all the IDs in a text document. So let me show you. I'll quit these and close these. And I have them all here. You can also do a comma list if you're doing it from like an email. Um, I can do it from within DaVinci as well. So I can go to the project window and, uh, oops, wrong thing. What I need to do is go into the info and do it from here. And I can share and I can just paste all the list in there. There it is. That'll uh, add them all. So you can see there I've got a lot of users, a lot of shared users now. It's a big team. Uh, so now let's get back to everybody and see if they can open up my project. So if everyone can uh, select the Cloud tab on the computers, 
And you should see my projects visible to you. And if everyone can open up my job, it'd be great. Um, let some people are starting up DaVinci. So there you should see it. So there shouldn't be any need to relink because I did that on my uh, Mac Studio over here before. So the media will automatically be pointing to the same storage. So the media should just appear and the timelines should just come up. Only people with different storage off-site would need to relink because, you know, DaVinci Resolve will track the storage for each person. But in our case, everyone's using the same cloud store. Uh, now, before we start also, if everyone could check um, set to camera originals in the proxy menu. Really, to make this a good test, we want to really load up the network by using camera original files. So if everyone could uh, open and uh, play my timeline, that'd be great. Now each user has my timeline playing with the shared media and we're all working together. The cloud store has enough speed to allow everyone to work at the same time. Uh, but what if my production company also has a studio with cameras? It'd be really great to be able to record multi-cam into the cloud store. You imagine having a, a studio like constantly shooting while the team is doing post-production all at the same time, all using a single cloud store. This would replace those really big expensive SAN network disk systems used by home facilities. You know, central storage is a really extremely fast way to work, but these SAN based systems are, are mechanical hard disks are very expensive and they require constant maintenance. So the Blackmagic Cloud Store really is a nice way to get the sort of SAN workflow without all the SAN problems. Um, but we are still connected to a cloud store over Ethernet and networks are chaotic and unpredictable. So if we want reliable recordings, we really need to consider network issues. You know, the network could be interrupted if there's a heavy load or the network could even fail right in the middle of a job. So we really need to deal with that. And so we need protection for live recording as it cannot go wrong. Luckily, our Hypedic Extreme product has a cache feature. Plus it has high-speed 10G Ethernet as well. So what this means is that we can use a Hypedic Extreme to record each camera into the cloud store. Now we've been working on a software update for Hypedic Extreme to enable recording into the Blackmagic Cloud Store. Then if you add an M.2 flash memory card, you can continue to record even if the network goes down. And this will give you reliable multi-cam recordings. So behind us over here, I've got nine Hypedic Extremes that simulate a nine camera studio. Now these decks are all connected to a 10G Ethernet switch. So let's plug that switch with all the Hyperdex into the cloud store. And uh, this Ethernet cable um, is, is what's connected to all the Hyperdex. So we'll plug that in. Um, so there it is. Um, now there's a new setting for connecting to storage unless you connect the, uh, select the, the cloud store. Plus you can also select to, uh, which folder to record into. Now the new menu is uh, located in the storage page and let me show that to you, it's over here. So the menu here, this is the new menu. See, there it is there, and there's a network button. And you can see the cloud store. And you can even go into the folders and select the folder, and there it is. Now it's connected. So that's the new menu. So every Hyperdeck here also has a cache added. And I actually, I can display a slide if the guys can cut to the slide showing you the where the cache is. It's on the bottom of the Hyperdeck. And you just insert the card in there, and there's a heatsink gasket you have to put on it to to thermally cool it. It's not very difficult to install. Now we've actually installed a two terabyte M.2 flash memory card into each deck. You can see it on the cache indicator if you can get a close up there. That's hours of cache on each deck. It's probably much bigger than we really needed. Um, now we've connected all the remote controls together as well, so they're all linked. So that means when I press record on the controller, all the decks will go and record together. So let's do that. I'll press record. So now they go. So now they're all recording. Now, we're recording all the Hyperdex into the Blackmagic Cloud Store, and they're all recording a pretty high data rate, actually. It's Ultra HD 2160p 5904 in ProRes. And you can see there, if you look, you can see it's a lot of data being recorded. You can see the Ethernet data graph showing the data being written. And now, of course, we've got everyone playing and using the, the videos playing back as well. Um, you can see the storage map where the Hyperdex are recording. You can actually see it where each Hyperdex is recording. If you look at the Hyperdex caches, you can see them working over here. So we can stop recording now and you'll see the cache empty out. It doesn't take very long because the network's so fast. So I'll stop recording now. Um, you can see there's the cache is still being written out. Yeah, we actually write through the caches, so there's always a little bit of data on the caches. Um, so if you look at the Ethernet graph, you can still it's, there's still some data remaining to be written. But it's a very robust setup. Um, so now the recording's complete, and there it is. The graph's dropped off because it's uh, finished ed 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 emptying out the caches. So now the recording's complete. Let's edit the video. And um, we can do this because we've recorded directly into the shared storage and all these computers can access the recordings. So I can go to my computer over here and we can add what we just recorded into the timeline. So let's do that. We'll create a new DaVinci project. Um, there it is. And we'll load the media in. And of course it's on my cloud store. It'll ask me to change the format because this is 59 and 4. There it is. So that's cool. So let's lay down one of the tracks in the timeline. Because it's multicam, we can then go into the sync bin. So let's let's do that. So I'll get the wide shot. 
There it is there. Actually, I'll do it as an edit. So I drop it down. There it is in the timeline. Now I can go into the sync bin and you can see it's synchronized all those recordings together. So it's cool. And then, you know, cool, you can do all the angles that are recorded. They're all in sync. They have the same time code. We can scroll up and down, add a cutaway. It's like if we wanted to add a cutaway, we can just do that. There it is there. And it's all in sync. So really anyone here can work with this media. Um, everyone can work on the same timeline. You know, if we want to get uh, the studio, like if we want to get this to a studio offsite, then we can create proxies. So let's create proxies for the new recording. Now remember how I said before it's possible to run more than one copy of the proxy journal, generator? Um, let's ask the training booth team to actually do this and we can show you. So if, can everybody run the proxy generator? Um, and we'll select uh, H64, which is the second item on the list. If you can get ready to, to do it. And uh, is everyone ready to start? And you can see what it looks like. Um, everyone ready to go? Okay, go for it. So you can see, there it is, look at that. Look, if you look at the data rate graph, you can see how fast it really is. It's really hitting the storage hard. And you can see it on the monitoring there. So it's literally the maximum speed. Each iMac is actually processing a different hyperdeck file. They're all working at the same time, but on different clips. It's like an instant render farm for proxies. And you can see that it's so fast, it's completely saturating the 10G connection from the studio to the cloud store. So let's come back to the cloud store um, and talk about that. You can see how powerful it really is. It's got extremely high performance. It's got the 10G Ethernet switch built in, handles Dropbox sync so you can share media globally. It automatically handles syncing proxies first. You can move jobs around the world really fast. It's an elegant design and it's very quiet. It means it's really perfect for television use. And it's also got the RAID 5 redundancy it has dual redundant power supplies. It's got the nice monitoring output. You can see the, um, you know, using a status on a simple TV monitor. So we think it's going to really help people. Um, so the Blackmagic Cloud Store will ship in about a month or so. We're still completing some of the work, but we need it to announce it so we can get it out in beta testing. Um, we also plan on a number of software updates soon. Like we'd like to um, be able to set the, print, the proxy sync to be set for each separate sync. At the moment, it's on the whole Cloud Store. Uh, also, manual priority of the sync order will be really good. So when you add a multiple syncs, be able to reorder them. A bit like how the proxy generator does it. So there's a few things we can add. Of course, customize user login. So there's a lot more we can really do. So initially, there'll be three models of the Blackmagic Cloud Store. There'll be a 20 terabyte, an 80 terabyte, and a 320 terabyte model. And that's the usable space. In reality, there's actually a bit of a fair bit of extra storage because of the RAID protection. So with these sizes, you can see that the Blackmagic Cloud Store is actually a high-end product. It's really designed for the larger facilities. You know, the 20 terabyte model will be priced at 9595 and the 80 terabyte model will be priced at 29995 And the 320 terabyte model will be billed to order, so we'll quote prices on that when it's ordered. Of course, the price is actually defined by the high cost of the uh, flash memory we use. Um, at these large capacities, it's quite a high in storage solution. And so it's extremely powerful, but we did think about smaller companies who don't need all that. You know, plus freelancers who are working from home or sort of small offices who don't need all this power. So to solve this problem, we actually have another more affordable model. Um, so it's called Blackmagic Cloud Store Mini. Let me bring it out and I'll show you. Actually, I'll uh, make some space here. So I'll move this over here. I'll bring it out. There it is here. As you can see, it's half rack width. Uh, that means you can use a Terranix Mini rack shelf to rack, rack mount two of them. It has eight terabytes of high-speed flash storage and a RAID 0 configuration. So let me check out, let's check out the connections. You can see there's a a 10G Ethernet port, so it's still very fast, but it also has a 1G Ethernet port for connecting your existing network. It's got like a switch in it. That means you can use it on higher speed regular, uh, and regular networks at the same time. Um, workstations connect via the 10G port for the higher speed, but everyone else can connect via the 1G port. It also has a USB port. Now the USB allows an interesting feature. Modern laptops don't actually have Ethernet because they're so thin. So we built the Ethernet dongle, those USB Ethernet dongles, we built it into the Cloud Store Mini. This means you don't need one of those USB dongles. You can just plug the USB cable from your computer directly into the Cloud Store Mini. The USB port's actually a network port when it's connected to a computer. So it's fantastic if you just want to access some files quickly. Now it also has that HDMI monitoring output. That is the same monitoring as the bigger Cloud Store. Um, so let's plug it in and we'll check it out. Turn it around. So we'll plug in the power first. Um, power, there it is. I forgot which cable I was using for a sec. There it is, there's the power. And we're good there. And now we'll plug in the computer in. Ethernet, because I want to copy my media folder. Okay, so, and I'll plug in the HDMI monitor as well so we can see it. Okay, so you can see the monitoring output looks very similar. So let's copy our media folder, but I'll need to get rid of the old proxy folder first, and I can actually rename that back again. 
Okay, so we'll mount the disc and we'll copy it over. There we are. Okay, let's copy our media folder across. There it goes. So you can see it's very fast. You can see the monitoring output. Um, it also has the same sync features. So while it's not as fast as the cloud store, it is very fast. Um, but what we'll do is we'll check out the speed with the training booth computers. Now I only have a single 10G Ethernet port here, so I'll unplug my computer and I'll plug it across to the, uh, to the uh, training booth. But the good thing is that um, we've already copied the file. So let's plug the training booth into the 10G Ethernet. So I'll unplug this and plug it back. Here's my training booth. Okay, so now I'll ask the team if they can connect to the Cloud Store Mini. Uh, so if you guys could switch your um, mount the Cloud Store Mini and uh, we can get everybody connected up. We should see them connecting actually as well. Uh, and we'll also need to switch the DaVinci timeline across to the Cloud Store Mini. So once everybody's connected, I guess if they can relink the timeline. Now we have the same shared project here using the same media on the Cloud Store Mini. Um, so once everyone's relinked, they should be able to start playing back the uh, timeline. There you go. So all these computers are playing from the single Cloud Store Mini. You can see it's still very fast. Um, I don't really have time to plug in the Hyperdex behind me, but that also works fine. So the Blackmagic Cloud Store is, I mean, is very powerful. It's extremely high performance. It's got the 10G Ethernet port. It has the Dropbox syncs. So you can share your media globally. It also supports the proxy workflow. And even though it's rack mount, it's also very quiet. Yeah, cooling's quite important with flash memory because it slows down when it's heavily used. The memory chips actually heat up and the data rate slows down. So Blackmagic Cloud Store Mini will actively cool the memory core to maintain performance like the Cloud Store does. Now the HDMI output, it's got that uh, for the monitoring. So it's got this really nice, um, it's a really nice model. It's powerful and it's affordable. So the Blackmagic Cloud Store Mini is actually available now. Initially, it'll be a single ter eight terabyte model. and It'll be priced at 2995. Again, the price is set by the cost of the flash memory, but it did start us thinking about the cost of flash memory. What if we did a model that didn't have any memory at all? A model that would use the disk you already have. So we've created that model and it's a bit different to the cloud stores. What it does, it transforms any USB-C disk into a network disk. And it's also a Dropbox cache because it has the sync features. Uh, but because you're adding the USB disk to the network, everyone can access it. So you don't need to copy files. The disk itself is actually on the network. Now the name of the new model is called Blackmagic Cloud Pod. And let me show it to you, I'll bring it out. In fact, I'll have to make a bit of space here. Let's move this across. There it is there. You can see it's quite small. It has all the network electronics built in. It also has an access indicator across the front so you can see when it's active. So let me show you the connections. They're on the back here. Um, so you can see it's got the high-speed 10G Ethernet port, so it's really quite fast. There's actually two USB ports for connecting disks, so it supports two separate disks at the same time. It also supports most USB-C disks. Um, maybe there's some of the really high-powered ones that won't support, but pretty much all disks. But basically any disk that works with our cameras um, it also supports USB disk arrays that have a hardware RAID chip. It has the same HDMI monitoring output, so you can see any of the storage map, connected users, Dropbox syncs, all that stuff. It also has a 12 volt DC power connection, and it includes a power supply. So let's plug it in. So I'll bring it around here. So I'll plug in the power first. I'll use the power from the from the hyperdeck. Get rid of a tangle here. There's the power, and I'll plug in the Ethernet. So I'll plug in. My Ethernet. There. Okay, so uh, let's plug in some monitoring so we can see what's going on because that'll be cool. So we should see that come up. There it is there. Um, so you can see there's no storage because there's no disk plugged in. So we need to plug in a USB disk. So let's do that. Um, let's pretend I've got a disk here. Let's pretend this disk just came back from a shoot and it was unplugged from a camera and I need to share it with the whole team. So we'll plug that in. Um, now we can access this disk across the network. So you can see there it's appeared on the uh, on the storage, on the on the monitor output. Um, so let's uh, mount it on the network. There it is there. There it is. So now anyone can access this disk, so let's load a clip. There it goes there. So you can see the activity um, indicator on the front. There it is there, it lights up. You can see that when you're scrolling. Um, I can also add Dropbox syncs if I need to, and I can run the Blackmagic proxy generator to generate proxies for this disk because it just came back from a shoot. So let's actually do that. So what I'll do is I'll close that window, I'll run the proxy generator. I'll clear those disks out. And I'll drop this disk in. 
and now I'll start the proxy generator. It's got the right proxies that we want. There it is there. And now it'll start generating proxies for this disk and it's generating them all the media, uh, proxies for all the media on this disk. Now imagine a freelancer using a cloud pod when they're working off-site or at home. You know, you only need to sync the proxies. Uh, using proxies only means you can just use a cheap disk and the proxies will sync in a few minutes, so it's the perfect freelancer solution for really anyone working off-site actually. Now, you know, like there are some limitations though. These flash disks can slow down when they're really heavily used because they can, they kind of consume a great storage and they can heat up when they're really loaded up. You know, when they get hot and they slow down. Now our Blackmagic cloud stores have active cooling so they stay fast even under heavy load. But for general use, I don't think that's a huge limitation. But the big advantage is you get your media on the, you know, the, the, the media disk from your shoot on the network instantly. So you don't even have this delay of copying the, uh, the files. Um, we've already half generated all the proxies for this media now. So the Blackmagic Cloud Pod is also available now. I think it's a great way to try out the cloud workflow. It'll priced, be priced at $395. It's more affordable because it doesn't have any flash memory. You know, you use USB disks. Uh, but I like that it still has the monitor app because that's kind of the fun bit. So I think it'll be very useful. Um, now, also, I wanted to come back to Hyperdeck Extreme. Now, in the demo, I used Hyperdeck Extreme 8K models um, for the recording, but these 8K models are pretty high-end and they're a bit overkill for most work. So we'll actually have a new model of Hyperdeck Extreme soon. It'll be called Hyperdeck Extreme 4K HDR. It has the same features, it has the same connections, it has a nice LCD screen and built-in scopes, but it's lower cost because it doesn't have the 8K codec built in. Uh, so it'll be priced at 2995 and we think it should be available in about a month or so. Um, with this model, it dramatically reduced the cost of ISO recording, um, but it still has the, slay, uh, the cache slot un un underneath, so you can add the M.2 memory card, which means you get reliable ISO recording even on a busy network. So I think this will be an important model. Um, as for the Hyperdeck Extreme software update that we showed with the network recording, we expect that again in a month or two. It's working well, but we need to beta test it. There are a lot of the stuff, it's, things are working between each other, so we need to do a lot of beta testing. And so that new software will also be a free update when it's available. Um, so we did talk about DaVinci Resolve 18 in this update, um, but there are a lot of uh, other collaboration features than the ones we showed you. Like there's Timeline Compare to check between differences in timelines. It's got live chat built in, so you can chat with other users, particularly when you're in different locations. So these are really quite useful features for collaborative workflows. However, cloud workflow is not the only thing we've been doing. We have some uh, clips that uh, we've got some trainers to do for us to show us some of the new features in DaVinci Resolve 18. So I'd like to play those clips for you now. So let's start with color and we'll show you the what's new in color video. In DaVinci Resolve 18, the addition of new effects and updates to existing tools has expanded grading functionality more than ever. The Object Mask is a groundbreaking tracking tool that intuitively detects and tracks objects within a shot. To activate it, open the Magic Mask palette and click the Object Mask button. Drag in the viewer to make an initial selection and enable the mask overlay to review and fine tune the result. When you're satisfied, track the shot using the transport controls in the palette. Once keyed, objects can be individually graded to produce the optimal look for your scene. The object mask produces very impressive results, even upon initial selection. However, it also features helpful additive and subtractive strokes to help with more challenging tracks. This makes it possible to select visually complex objects and follow them, even as they are obscured by other elements in the scene or if they leave the frame. Going beyond simple chroma and luma keying, the object mask makes precise selections even when there are strong shadows or dramatic fluctuations in light. The palette's parameters allow you to control the complexity of the mat, with the better quality suited for selections with very fine detail, like fur or hair. The object mask has been tested on thousands of objects and has a recognition rate unlike any other tool in the industry. This includes people, animals, vehicles, facial features, and countless other elements. Use the object mask to emphasize products and commercials, perform sky replacements, or any number of creative applications that even we haven't thought of yet. In the Resolve Effects panel, the new Depth Map effect generates a 3D matte key that will allow you to grade the foreground of a shot separately from the background, or vice versa. After adding the Depth Map tool to your node pipeline, use the comprehensive parameters in the OpenFX palette to determine the depth of the matte, to isolate a range, and finesse the matte for a smooth result. Once the depth has been successfully mapped, 
connect the output key of the depth map node to any downstream corrector node to isolate grades or effects. Use this workflow to bring greater attention to action in the foreground, to help interview subjects stand out, to add atmosphere to a scene, or even to mimic a shallow depth of field with the help of a blur tool. The new surface tracker can be used to apply images or effects to elements with a moving surface. In particular, it's designed to work with textured surfaces that fold or change perspective in dramatic ways, like a t-shirt, a banner, or the side of a face. After dragging the surface tracker effect into your node pipeline, click on the viewer to define the bounds of the area you wish to track. Then click the Mesh button to review the default grid that's generated based on your area selection. The points and their connection lines represent the trackable features of the texture. They can be increased and refined in the Mesh options. Run the track and then adjust parameters to change the motion range or mesh rigidity. You can then drag and drop an image into the node pipeline, connect it to the surface tracker node, and use the settings to adjust its size and placement on the tracked surface. You can seamlessly blend your tracked image to the environment with the help of standard corrector nodes and existing effects like film grain and patch replacer. And with a slightly different workflow, you can also apply effects to the warped surface by first generating a stabilized output of the area and reapplying it to the surface tracker. The surface tracker offers robust pattern recognition and warps in response to motion in the tracked surface, but it remains highly customizable. You can change mesh bounds, introduce holes, or design your own track pattern by warping a default mesh to match the folds of a material. You can also combine the surface tracker with power windows to isolate the end result to specific regions of the tracked area. The beauty effect now features an ultra beauty mode that gives you advanced control over a subject when performing corrective beauty work. Developed with feedback from professional colorists, this tool makes it possible to address general imperfections by smoothing skin and then recovering detail to produce a result that is natural and complementary to the subject. This approach results in some interesting application potential when it comes to smoothing any rough surface, from damaged walls and roads to distracting reflections or even video compression artifacts like banding and aliasing. The fast noise effect generates randomized noise data that can be used to replicate different types of atmosphere or particle-like effects. Its many parameters give you advanced control over the final appearance of the noise, but you can also use the preset menu at the top to get a quick start on effects like mist and smoke, which you can then track to the motion of your shot using the effects tracker. Other presets act as displacement maps that can warp your image to imitate the motion of water or heat haze. The edge detect effect has been reworked to include new gamma and filter controls, as well as a new half edge option that allows you to keep only the light or dark side of an edge. Use this tool to sharpen soft clips or inversely to create a glow around a subject. The despill effect helps clean up subjects affected by unwanted color spills. It works with green, blue, and even red chroma screens. Combine it with a magic mask to remove natural color cast from environments with dominant hues. The Transform plugin now supports an additional RGB input, allowing you to position and composite one image over another within a single clip. In the Chromatic Aberration Removal plugin, a green-purple slider has been added to help counteract every possible variation of chromatic lens aberration. In the Lens Reflections effect, Bokeh has been added as a preset, allowing you to imitate this distinct lens aesthetic on out-of-focus lens reflections generated from highlights and light sources. And when working with the Film Grain plugin, you now have the option to animate it with every refresh, meaning that instead of seeing static grain, you will now have animated grain, giving you a clearer representation of your final look as you are grading. Other system improvements give you the option to render individual clips with timeline effects. There's now support for 10-bit viewers on Windows and Linux and the option to stream video outputs to remote monitors when collaborating with others. This covers just some of the new features in DaVinci Resolve 18's color page. Thank you for watching. That's really great. I mean, some of our AI technology now is really amazing. So next up, let's check out what's new in editing. DaVinci Resolve 18 has multiple improvements for editors and VFX artists. The Refresh Project Manager now has dedicated buttons for easier import and export of DaVinci Resolve project files along with new options for copying projects between local, network, and cloud-based project libraries. 
and now you can instantly set customized project settings to be the default for all new projects using the option in the project settings window. A new user preference option allows you to automatically generate keywords when importing media that contains macOS finder tags, which are then instantly displayed within the keyword smart bins. The new Blackmagic Proxy Generator app automatically creates proxy files for media placed in a specific watch folder. These proxy files are then automatically linked when the full res camera files are imported into a project. This automatic linking also happens if the proxies are created once the media has been imported. It's also now easier to identify which clips in your project are using proxy files. A new proxy icon is displayed next to the clip name or on the clip thumbnail in the media pool. The same icon can also be seen for any clips using proxy media in the timeline and in the colour page. If generating proxy files from Resolve, you can now choose where the proxies will be stored from new options in the Media Storage Preferences. You can use the proxy subfolders in the media file locations as the Proxy Generator app does, the location set in the Project Settings, or have Resolve ask where the proxies should be stored each time you choose to generate them. A new proxy handling submenu option allows you to specify how your proxy files are used. Preferred proxies will use available proxy media for all clips. If no proxies are available, the original media file is used. Prefer camera originals will ignore any proxies and use the original media file. But if the original file isn't available and a proxy file is, then the proxy will be used. These options are particularly useful when working remotely using the new cloud collaboration features as they enable you to work with available files as they are being synced. Alternatively, you can choose to disable all proxies when grading or working on visual effects, with a dedicated menu for these options being available in the cut page. DaVinci Resolve 18 has multiple improvements for subtitling with extended support for importing TTML and XML files and subtitles embedded in XMF and IMF files. In the timeline, each subtitle track can now contain multiple simultaneous captions. Simply right-click the subtitle track in the timeline to add a new region or rename an existing region. Each region can have its own formatting and can contain additional overlapping captions, ideal for indicating different speakers or multiple simultaneous sounds on complex soundtracks. That wouldn't be possible. Well, it's possible, Dr. Kaminsky, because it's happening. I need you to tell me everything you know about the sinks. For larger multicam projects, a new 5x5 layout allows you to see up to 25 different angles at the same time. Shape, iris and white transitions now have a new option for quickly reversing the direction of those transitions. You can now navigate directly to keyframes outside the limits of trimmed timeline clips either using the next and previous keyframe controls in the inspector or by using keyboard shortcuts, ideal for refining animations beyond a clip's duration in the timeline. Improvements to the way fusion elements are now processed have resulted in huge increases to real-time performance for many of the fusion templates in the edit page. In DaVinci Resolve 18, many of the included templates can now play back in real time without the need to enable the render cache. The updated live preview feature for text clips and fusion templates also allows for the instant adjustment of colors. Significant performance changes have been introduced to Fusion's paint tool, making it a faster GPU accelerated tool with higher quality results and increased rendering speeds, making this an all round more productive tool.
Fusion's Merge tool now includes additional blend modes to help create various effects and looks. This support has been extended to imported PSD files, preserving any blending operations that may have been used in the original source file. Five new merge operations have also been included. Conjoint and disjoint make it easier to combine alpha channels. Whilst mask and stencil allow you to easily merge and combine mats. DaVinci Resolve 18 now also supports direct uploading to supported social media accounts as part of the Deliver page settings. And the new Quick Export window features improved layouts for easier access to multiple export presets. So that's great, there's some really nice new features there. Okay, so next up is audio, so let's check out what's new in Fairlight Audio. The Fairlight Audio page is loaded with new features intuitive controls, and enhanced tools for professional audio editing, mixing and recording in traditional and multi-user workflows. Flexbus is Fairlight's flexible audio busing and routing system. DaVinci Resolve 18 users can now convert a legacy Fixbus project to Flexbus in the project settings dialog. Flexbus projects offer new and innovative workflows with nested timelines, so you can quickly merge one timeline into another. Let's take a closer look. In this example, I need to add the Dialog Mixer's timeline to the master mix, so I'll simply drag the Dialog timeline to an empty track, where it appears as a single clip that can be played as is, or expanded with a right click, and decomposed to new tracks. From here, there are several options. Choosing new matching buses, add your mix from the nested timeline to the existing timeline by creating completely new matching buses, keeping both the original buses in the current timeline and buses from the nested timeline intact. The new buses include all of the bus routings, processing, settings, and automation from the nested source timeline. Previously existing buses in the current timeline are not affected in any way. This workflow is great for combining mix elements from different contributors' work into a template or master timeline for mixing. If you want to merge your mix to an existing mix in another timeline, choose the Preserve option, which preserves all of the master bus information in the current timeline and routes existing buses from the source nest to the same buses in the open timeline. In this example, I'll add a Foley Effects mix to a mix in progress and choose the Decompose to New Tracks Preserve Existing Paths option. This preserves the mix in progress. All the incoming tracks are routed to the matching buses without changing any of their settings or automation. If you have additional buses in your nested source timeline, they'll be brought in as new buses with all their connections and information intact. There's also a Clips Only option available on the Edit page for merging only clips from the nest into existing tracks in the current timeline. Here, I'll drag the edited Foley session to the master timeline. Go to the Edit page and decompose Clips Only. Now the Foley clips are in perfect sync and ready for mixing. With DaVinci Resolve 18, you can freely rearrange tracks and buses in the Tracks Index. You can even move buses and VCA groups into the Tracks area to customize fader mapping and organize your mix. The new track and bus order is reflected in the Monitoring Panel, Timeline, and Mixer. Are you sure? Yes. In the Mixer, you can choose the option for Single Mixer View, which removes the divider between the tracks and buses. You can reset the track order anytime, right here in the Mixer Options menu. The Fairlight Mixer offers a variety of enhanced processing features, like improved plugin management with easy menu options to delete, disable, or replace plugins. Fairlight's built-in channel EQ and Dynamics processing controls are more intuitive than ever, with single-click bypass to toggle on or off, right-click or keyboard shortcut options to copy and paste to another channel, and double-click to open. Inside the Channel Strip EQ window, there's a set of new built-in presets for dialogue, sound design, 
and even music mastering. There's also improved cue controls with mouse wheel input. Simply hover over the handle on the graph and scroll the mouse wheel to raise or narrow the bandwidth. The Channel Dynamics window also includes a handy set of built-in presets, enhanced metering and gain display, plus new soft knee and dry mix controls in Flexbus projects. Flexbus routing is faster than ever. Simply click to choose one bus at a time or hold the Option Alt modifier key to apply to all selected tracks or buses at once. This is awesome for quickly routing, clearing, or disabling Flexbus outputs and sends. Over in the timeline, you'll find a variety of improvements based on user requests, like the ability to double click a clip in the timeline to rename it and easily set per-track clip names for new recordings right in the timeline. You'll also find improved pitch shifting and audio read times for multi-channel audio. and Easy Option Alt Modifier combinations to add and remove keyframes. For elastic wave speed changes, use Command Click to add keyframes and Command Option Click to remove them. For clip gain, use Option Click to add keyframes and Command Option Click to remove them. You can even apply clip gain to a range selection in either 1 decibel or 3 decibel increments. DaVinci Resolve 18 also offers a variety of audio nudge options, including new audio subframe nudge controls for clip and range selections. Choose either millisecond or subframe intervals, set the amount, and save. Feel free to create your own subframe nudge shortcuts in the keyboard customization window. Fairlight's automation toolset now includes independent controls to enable automation and expose global controls for automation parameter type so you can show or hide the automation control toolbar as needed without affecting whether the automation is on or off. Finally, there's improved audio metering with IEC, Digital VU, and custom meter presets with project settings for level detector, scale, decay, peak indicator, and more so you can choose your preferred metering settings for your recording, editing, and mixing sessions. These are just some of the exciting new audio features in DaVinci Resolve 18. So I think this is a really nice update. It's a, it's a monster update, it's a big one. As you know, we've been actually releasing acceleration updates for the Apple M1 chip over the last year. And we've rewritten the entire rendering engine so it could support these new M1 computers. Plus we've rewritten the entire project management tool to support the cloud workflows. So there's a lot of new code in DaVinci Resolve 18. So what that means is to ensure that it's all really working well, we're gonna release it as a public beta. It'll be available from today. Um, now DaVinci Resolve 18 will be a free update for all users. It's a public beta, so don't install it in the middle of a job. You know, we, we will, you will have to do a database upgrade after you install it, because there's some database changes. I always export my projects as a DRP file just for safety. But I think it's gonna be really exciting to try out these new cloud workflows. Now the Blackmagic Proxy Generator will inc be included free with DaVinci Resolve Studio. It's installed into the Applications folder as a separate application, and you can just leave it running and it'll create proxies automatically. Now there's actually also a version of the Blackmagic, the Blackmagic Proxy Generator included with the free DaVinci Resolve, but it's called Blackmagic Proxy Generator Lite. It's the same, but it's actually missing some of the file formats, and that's due to licensing. So you, you only get the full uh, uh, file formats with DaVinci Resolve Studio, but it's a really good uh, to include it anyway, even if it's a bit limited. The Blackmagic Proxy Generator Lite will be included with the Cloud Store uh, products as well, and it's supported on both Mac and Windows. But the Windows version actually has less codecs than the Mac version. That's because the Lite version uses codecs built into the operating system, so it's really dependent on that. But you can fix that on the Windows side if you buy the codec upgrade from Microsoft for Windows. Um, so now I wanna come back to Blackmagic Cloud. 
Now I haven't shown you the presentations feature yet, and so this is pretty exciting and it lets you present your work to clients. So let me show you now how it works. And so we'll start by coming back to the computer and selecting presentations. So let me come back, I'll click that. And I'll go back to all well, those presentations up there. There we are. Now we need to create a new presentation, so I'll do that. Oh. There we go, so let's create a new one. So now we've got a new presentation, we can see all the features, and what I'll do is I'll widen things out a bit, whoops. So give this all some space. So presentations are always live. So let me well, I'll explain the, the features we've got here first. So you can see on the left-hand side here, this is where we have people. We can also upload clips. Um, we've also got a video chat along the top here. This is where we present the videos in this section here. And over here we can do uh, markers and annotations, you know, and, and chat. So you can see the features there. Now these, as I was saying, these, when, these presentations are always active. You just have to arrange a time for everyone to meet. Uh, and you can log in any time if you need to check something. A good example if you wanted to read or add some annotations. So let's upload a video and we'll, um, we'll review it. So we'll go into Clips, Upload Files, and we've got a file on our desktop. This is a video of our around our office. So we'll upload that. There it is now and it's uploading. Uh, you can also upload direct from DaVinci Resolve. So, you know, we've got the team here in the studio. So what we want to do is share the, uh, the presentation with them. Now this could be a team spread around the world or a team, you know, in different parts of the building. So to do that, we'll add some users. Now this is similar to the project server. I just add some people. And yeah, you use their Blackmagic Cloud ID to do that. Um, so let's add some users. And it's easy, I just go here. I'll need to go to my text file and grab everyone's Blackmagic Cloud IDs. There it is there. I think we've added it. There it is, they're all up. Now we've got a presentation set up with multiple users. So that should bring everyone online. Now every user will get notified via email that they've built a, a shared presentation. Um, so they just log into Blackmagic Cloud and see the presentations that are active for them. And you can see everyone connecting now. So let's get some of the other users to connect. So if everyone can connect up, I can see some of the people coming online already. Probably worth muting your mics to make sure because we're all in the same studio. So we'll probably get an echo if there's any mics on. Uh, so now we're all connected. You can see we can use the video conference along the top to chat. Hi everyone, I know our mics are off, we can all wave. <laughs> Do sign language. Welcome to the meeting, you know. Now we wanna watch the, um, the videos, we can watch the videos, we can add annotations, we can do all these things. But a lot of the time we actually wanna talk about the same shot. You know, if we're working on something, we're all, you know, wanna focus on, keep everyone synced up. So we need to really sync everyone. Now this, now what we need to do is make sure that we're all looking at the same point in the video. So to do that, we can use the sync playback control. Uh, and then when we shuttle and play, everyone's playing in sync. So let me enable that. So I just go down here to the sync control and if I move along the timeline, you should see everyone move to the same spot. And then if I hit play, we should be able to see everyone play. So you see everyone's playing together, there it is. So it's really cool. Um, so you can see that on the training booth, you know, we're all looking at the same part of the video. So when we add annotations, we're all adding annotations to the same spot. So it's very powerful. Let's actually add an annotation, I'll just stop and I'll uh, I'll turn off the sync so we can all actually add a few annotations. Someone's already added one, so I can add one here. Um, oops, if I can spell right. So I can add one. Now oh, there's a few there. It's cool, so you can see all the annotations up on the right hand side. Now these annotations can be exported out to DaVinci and they're loaded into the timeline, so this means you can present to a client and their feedback can be logged in the annotations. And then it's visible in DaVinci. Now this will work in DaVinci as well as other edit software. So you can see really how powerful Blackmagic Cloud is. The project server lets you collaborate between multiple users. That means you can access a world of creative talent. Then with presentations, you can present to clients anywhere. Or you can use it for large production teams, bringing a production team together. Presentations always stay active, so it's a dedicated meeting room that you can use for as long as you need it. It's really nice to leave it running in the background while you work. And then people can just log in and start chatting, so it's pretty cool. So initially we'll be releasing Blackmagic Cloud as a public beta. The project server will be a public beta and the presentations will be a private beta. So this means you can try out the cloud workflows with DaVinci Resolve 18 public beta. Now the Blackmagic Cloud website should be online today. If it's not online today, it'll be online in the next few days. You know, it really depends on the server loads. We're gonna try and launch it in as many countries as we can, but it might take a few weeks to roll that out worldwide. We'll probably, we might start in the US and then out of other countries as fast as we can. But the server work behind Blackmagic Cloud is actually pretty complex. 
So we'll work as fast as we can, but please be patient with us while we get it all up and running. You know, we, um, we might need a little bit more time than we expected once things really get loaded up. Okay, now let's talk about the cost. So the cost will be $5 per library per month. We'll only charge for the library. So there's no charge for users who share the project, only the host. So a company could pay the $5 and share it for dozens of freelancers and it would be free for all the freelancers. We think this will help you connect to talent faster because they don't need to do anything. All you have to do is share the project with the, with the Blackmagic Cloud ID. And there's no charge for a Blackmagic Cloud ID so they don't need to pay anything. Plus Blackmagic Cloud even works with the free DaVinci Resolve. So a freelancer doesn't have to pay for the cloud and they don't have to pay for the software. You can download the software for free and run it on the computer you already own. Plus you never get trapped as you can export the project file out from Blackmagic Cloud. This means you can export your project from Blackmagic Cloud then delete the library and the costs will stop. That's great if you don't have any shared jobs running. Um, you don't get charged for stuff you're not using. Also, it's worth noting that with the older DaVinci Resolve 17 projects, it could be a little slower if you copy them into Blackmagic Cloud because in those older project format, we stored a bunch of stuff that we didn't really need. But it's only really an issue for very complex film jobs and most people doing really complex film jobs have fast internet, so I don't think it'll be an issue. I don't think anyone will see any issues there. But DaVinci, DaVinci Resolve 18 projects are fine. Um, of course, the DaVinci Resolve project server app is still included with DaVinci Resolve. Now that software's also been updated, so it's much faster in DaVinci Resolve 18. So this means now that um, it'll handle people working off-site, which is great. Um, it's a simple app that runs on the computer you already own. It means you don't have to pay anything at all if you use that app for your shared projects. But technically it's a little harder to set up because you need to use a VPN for the remote users. Um, but it's a good solution for technically skilled people who want to keep their workflow private because it's totally private. Um, the network tab in the DaVinci project window is where you actually connect to the private server app. You know, you connect via an IP address, so it's not quite as easy as Blackmagic Cloud, but you do get full control. And it's often how a lot of the big film studios work. Um, in many ways, the DaVinci Resolve project server app is the best solution for working on an internal network because um, you've got it all local. Um, as for presentations, there'll also be a charge for that, but we haven't quite worked the specific cost for it. But again, only the host will pay. None of the shared users will pay. And we'll let you know how much presentations cost when it's publicly available. Uh, but we'll focus on the collaborative workflows first. So that's about it for this update. Uh, we sure have covered a lot of new products. Uh, we introduced Blackmagic Cloud and showed the project server. We introduced DaVinci Resolve 18 with collaborative workflows. We showed how to connect to a shared project. We introduced the Blackmagic Cloud Store products for sharing media. We showed you the new proxy generator application. Uh, you can see how easy it is to use proxies in DaVinci Resolve 18. In this update, we also introduced Hyperdeck Shuttle and showed how it can browse the cloud store. We introduced Blackmagic Cloud presentation, so it's a lot of new things. It could all seem a bit complex, but each part's not really difficult to understand. But over the next few months, we'll be really focused on improvements and how people use it, you know, as everyone starts to use it. Um, plus, we'll be at the NAB show in Las Vegas, so it'll be great to chat about this workflow. You know, if you do start using the Blackmagic Cloud, then we'd love to talk to you. Anyway, I hope you like these new products. I really can't wait to see how they're used. I can't wait to get back to shows and just talk to people in person. It'll be so great. Okay, well, take care and thanks for watching the update. Bye.